for many years, scientists have sought new ways to harness the power of light. Now, outside the market town of Hitchin, 20 miles north of London, light is being put to an entirely new use. Engineers are installing a new telephone system, which, when complete, will be the most advanced of its kind in the world. For this cable contains not metal wires, but fine strands of glass. And instead of carrying information by an electrical current, it carries it by light. The new cable is the latest solution to a problem as old as the telephone itself. How to cope with increased demand without digging up the ground to lay new cables as soon as the capacity of existing ones is exhausted. The problem has been made more acute by the growing need to transmit signals like television and computer data with far higher bandwidths than telephone calls, which therefore require more and bigger cables. One solution was to replace cables based on pairs of copper wires with higher capacity coaxial cables. But even 50 years ago, television pioneer John Logie Baird realized that light could be modulated to transmit information and that its much higher frequencies should, at least in theory, offer enormously greater bandwidth than electricity and thus be capable of carrying much more information. But at that time, he failed to find either a suitable light source or a carrier that could transmit light without loss or dispersion. The solution to these problems was eventually found here at Standard Telecommunication Laboratories at Harlow in Essex. Two scientists, Charles Keo and George Hockham, produced a revolutionary paper on which the subsequent development of this new technology has been based. It showed how the semiconductor diode laser could provide an appropriate light source and that it was possible to make a thin glass fiber whose carefully controlled optical properties would enable it to transmit light over long distances. The principle of an optical communication system is relatively simple. Conventional electronic signals, telephone, television, data or whatever, are converted by the light source into pulses of light. By making the outer cladding of the fiber of a lower refractive index than the inner core, the light pulses bounce from side to side and are picked up at the other end by a conventional photodiode which converts them back into electrical signals. The potential advantages of optical systems are enormous. In contrast to these large and cumbersome metal cables, an optical cable of equal capacity can, because of the large bandwidths offered by the high frequency of light, be much smaller, lighter and therefore cheaper and easier to install. As light is the medium of transmission, there's no crosstalk and no insulation problem. And as the glass fibre is impossible to tap without detection, optical systems are totally secure and therefore ideal for military and many other applications. These advantages encouraged standard telephones and cables, STL's parent company, to make it a priority investment to turn the optical communications theory into an operational reality. In just 10 years of further research and development, STC were able, in 1976, to open Europe's first fully commercial plant for the manufacture of optical fiber, cable and allied systems. But how would one convince potential customers, including the world's telecommunications administrations, that the apparently fragile fibres could withstand the hardships of actual use in the outside world? STC decided on a totally practical approach. They reached agreement with the British Post Office on the installation of an optical cable system in existing ducts. They sought a route that presented above average installation difficulties and decided that the demonstration system should operate at 140 megabits per second, the highest internationally agreed digital transmission rate. The route chosen lay between two medium-sized English towns, Hitchin and Stevenage. It passed under a motorway.
also a railway line. and a network of power lines that could cause interference to conventional cables. Other typical installation difficulties included flooded manholes, a variety of different ducts, some already filled with cables, and a series of tight bends round which the cable would have to be drawn. The nine kilometre route involved the use of repeaters. In this initial demonstration, they're set at three kilometre intervals, but experience has already shown that much longer repeater spacings will be possible in the future. A wide variety of problems confronted the engineers as they struggled to create what would undoubtedly be the most advanced optical communication system in the world. One such problem lay in the development of a suitable light source. The semiconductor diode laser in its technological infancy when optical communications were first mooted, was seen to be the ideal solution. The active part of the laser is in this minute chip. This consists of layers of gallium arsenide and gallium aluminium arsenide in a complex sandwich structure. A low current passed through the diode causes electrons and holes to combine in the active region to produce light. As the current increases, the active region exhibits optical gain and as a result of reflection from the end faces, laser oscillation occurs. But how does one fit the broad spread of light into a glass fibre thinner than a human hair? The answer was found by laying thin layers of insulating material in such a way that the current from the electrical contact is constrained into a narrow stripe. This creates a light emitting region of a size identical with the light guiding core of the optical fibre. A further problem is that the build up of the laser's output, though gradual at first, becomes very rapid with the increase of current and if uncontrolled would soon reach a point at which the laser would burn out. To regulate the output to the required level, there needed to be some method of measurement and control. STC's engineers took advantage of the fact that the laser chip emits light in two directions. The light from the back is linked through a detector to a feedback control. When the light has reached the required intensity, this feedback control regulates the power supply keeping the light at the right level regardless of changes in the laser's characteristics due to temperature or aging effects. In this testing area, some of these lasers have been on continuous test for many thousands of hours and an operational laser life of several years is now feasible. The whole system was gradually assembled and tested in the laboratory. The special 140 megabit terminal equipment was provided by STC and two other subsidiaries of the International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, BTM of Belgium and Farce Standard of Italy. The exchange equipment was linked by the optical cable to the main laboratory. The fact that the nine kilometers of cable remained in coils during tests in no way affected the performance of the system. A crucial problem was how to join the sections of fiber together the problem was solved by the development of a special splicing jig. The technique involves collapsing a fine glass sleeve over one end of the fibre by heating it, carefully inserting the other end, and heating this. Then fixing a metal sheath over the whole joint to protect it. The equipment is portable and the technique simple enough for installation engineers to learn after training. The repeaters were designed to run on normal post office power supplies and special connectors were developed to link the optical fibers into the repeaters. Test equipment was built to evaluate the performance of the system by passing simulated traffic along the cable between the terminals of the 140 megabit rate. This means that the laser chip is oscillating 140 million times a second. And this tiny fibre is carrying sufficient information for almost 2,000 simultaneous telephone calls. All the design targets, 
considered ambitious when the demonstration was planned in 1975, were met by March 1977, and in several instances, surpassed. Meanwhile, the cable itself was subjected to rigorous tests. Laid across a roadway, one length withstood 30,000 vehicle movements without significant deterioration. A bending test simulated the flexing and tension that the cable would have to cope with as it is laid. The results surprised everybody. After this high-powered impact test, more aggressive than the clumsiest engineer's foot, the copper wires contained within the cable to carry power to the repeaters broke before the seemingly delicate glass fibers. Finally, a specially built tensile test rig put the cable under a strain of 200 kilograms. This indicated that the cable could withstand a 2% extension without damage. The question now became, could these results be repeated when the system was installed in the field? Cable installation began on a cold, wet day at the end of April 1977. 